Welcome back, everybody, to the Orbital Tribe. This is Mignon, your host and creator of this podcast. Here we are at the season finale of the Orbital Tribe, season one. It's been a good season. I want to thank y'all for your support. Um, to those of you who have liked and subscribed and interacted, uh, please continue to do so uh, as far as you know, sharing the content. And um, getting other people to subscribe and listen and like. Uh, This final episode, I think, is really important because it is a topic that I feel like isn't really delved deep into. We hear it, but I don't know how critically we think about it. And that is fear. Uh, The Bible says that a perfect love cast out all fear because where there is fear, there is torment. Um, and I am of the mind that there are only two things in life, either fear or love. Um, I don't know if fear is the opposite of love, but in a way I think it might be because when we're afraid, we do unloving things. Um, You know, they say the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. You know, I believe that too. But, I mean, what is the motivation of that indifference? They also say uh, that the Bible says 365 times, do not be afraid. So for every day of the year, there is a reminder from God to not be afraid. Um. You know, the Bible says, uh, uh, David, he said in the Psalms, he's like, why should I be afraid? What can man do to me? You know, in the New Testament, I believe it's Paul. He says, uh, if God's for me, who can be against me? So, you know, there's just so much to talk about with fear, but I think I'd like to really hone in on how I believe, again, there's only fear or love. At the root of mental illness, uh, at the root of instability and unrest and war and poverty and greed and sin, I believe is fear. Um, Gosh, the scripture that was uh, I was just about to say. Um, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and sound mind. Mental, not having a sound mind is mental illness. So I like, I believe that um, at the root of depression is the fear that things will never change. At the root of anxiety, the fear is that things will get worse. At the root of delusion is the fear of your current reality and facing it. Um, At the root of pride is the fear of not being enough. The root of greed is fear that there will be scarcity. At the root of lust, there's fear that this opportunity to indulge in pleasure won't come again. Right. And not just, again, it's not always sexual, right? It's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Just the fear that this opportunity won't come again because lust has an urgency to it. Lust is desire on steroids. It's lust is I want this and I want it now. And that urgency I think is where that fear lies. And the fear is what creates the lust. And that's where the sin comes in. Because if you look at lust, a close cousin to it is desire. Desire isn't sin. As a matter of fact, you know, the Bible says that those who uh, desire or hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. So desire is actually a very necessary emotion. It's just when you put desire on steroids and you add that urgency to it is that breeding ground for lust. So I think at the root of sin, at the root of mental illness is fear. 
And so, of course, with mental health, anything with mental health and healing, you got to get to the root. Where does our fear come from? Because think about it. Babies will climb bookshelves. They will try to pull a pot off the stove. Babies are fearless to the point of their own detriment. So what does that tell us about fear? We know that a baby isn't afraid to pull a pot off the stove because they don't know what could happen. They had to learn about things that are hot and things that are cold. So what is fear? Fear is learned. Someone taught you to be afraid. Something, right? Some event taught us to be afraid. And our fear creates these trauma responses and creates these limiting beliefs and these lies. And we have to figure out how to navigate through life so that we can make it safely to death. (laughs) If you really think about it, there's a quote that says so many people are trying to make it safely to death because so many people are just so fearful. Xenophobia, right? People who don't like, you know, immigrants, They're afraid of the immigrants coming and what they're going to do. And they're going to take over our country and take our jobs. That's just that fear that there won't be enough left for them. So. Of course, I can say to you, do not be afraid. But the question is, how do I not be afraid? Well, I've quoted this scripture a lot because It's so applicable to so many areas of life, but here it is again. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Hmm. What does freedom and fear have to do with each other? Fear is a form of bondage, right? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and sound mind. When you have a sound mind, you know the truth. And you're free. You're free to think. You're free to feel. You're free to go through life untethered. So knowing the truth of God's word is what unburdens us from the shackles of fear. And you're like, okay, Mignon, if I'm struggling with lust, you're telling me I'm struggling with fear. I would. I would say that the learned behavior of lust is just an outgrowth of something you're thinking. Like if you're watching a lot of porn, if you're having a lot of um, biblically unsanctioned sex, then I believe that Somewhere along the way, the idea was probably implanted that um, love would be hard for you. Or the idea that you won't get a lot of comfort in life. You won't experience a lot of pleasure in life for whatever reason, right? It could have been... um, You just overheard the adults talking in your family saying, you know, just those things adults can say, like, I got to go punch that clock. Yeah, ain't no rest for the wicked. And you're little and you're like, oh, so wicked people have to work. Like you take it literally. And everyone in your family had to work. And maybe this auntie is divorced and this auntie is divorced. And that uncle got four and five baby mamas. And you know, you've seen a lot of dysfunction and you just seen around you, a lot of people don't have healthy, happy love lives. And so maybe your lust is fueled by the belief that it's not coming for you. So you have to grab hold of what pleasure you can, when you can, and you must do it then because when will you ever feel this good again? 
How can I turn down this opportunity to escape from the lingering pain that comes from the belief that I probably won't have love? So this is finally an opportunity to A, step away, step away from that pain, but B, maybe it'll be proof that love is coming. So there's also some twisted sense of hope as well. Greed is easy. Like if you're selfish or greedy, that's so easy. You're afraid there won't be enough for you. You're afraid that if you share, right, speaking more to the selfish side of it, then there won't be enough left over for you. And if you're greedy, you take more than you need because it's like, oh, well, this, I'm, I'm going to take, take as much as I can so it can last as long as possible or so that I can be filled because maybe deep down there's something in you that needs to be filled that you're trying to fill with stuff. But baby, it's a god size hole. You'll never acquire enough. That's why greed is um, so... That's why it can be so insidious. You know how the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil? That's why greed is so horrific because it causes so many people to do so many heinous things. I I didn't watch the Jeffrey Epstein documentary, but wasn't there a woman who would recruit young girls for him? And wasn't he paying her like really well? That's greed. Look at how greed wreaks all this havoc in people's lives. And the thing is, rich people know that. Rich people know they can get people to do something strange for a little piece of change. And they got their wealth by being greedy, you know, or someone in their family line was greedy. You know, somebody in their family line um, brokered um, unsavory deals. Someone in their family line didn't pay their workers a living wage back in the day before they had unions, and it was an unsafe work environment because it was cheaper. Someone in their family line owned slaves. So that fear of there not being enough is what fuels so much hurt and heartache around the world. Because even though people might have billions, it's still not enough. And that's because it's a God-sized hole that we're trying to fill. And it, the hole is being fueled by fear. But if you knew the truth, the truth would set you free and you would have power and you will have love and you'll have sound mind. Fear is why you're depressed. It's why you're anxious. It's why you're, um, it's why you're the type of person who gets super defensive. Like, no, I don't. I'm not like that. No, I'm not. Because you're afraid of looking at yourself and realizing you need work. Because if you realize you need work, then that means there's something wrong with me. When, no, no. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. There's just some things you became. There's just some things you learned that you have to unlearn. There's nothing inherently wrong with any of us. But the problem is, like we talked about in the episode about lies, is we're accused of lies by the enemy because we don't know the truth. We don't know how to combat it. And we believe those things about ourselves. And then we're afraid of someone finding those things out about us. So we have shame. And so we try to cover our shame up with, um, you know, these defense mechanisms. And so our shame trying to cover up the things we're insecure about becomes pride because pride is that overcompensation of not being enough. So now you've got multiple issues simply because you believed a lie somewhere along the way and that lie made you afraid and it made you shameful and it made you insecure and now it's made you prideful. Um, so sp fear is complicated and you're going to have to do a deep dive into your own life if you realize, some people might not even realize they're fe fearful. I didn't realize I was fearful. I did not. Because I thought it was, um, you know, highly functioning, depressed. You know, I thought it was, um, oh, 
what's I'm, and I'm depressed because I'm not working in the career I want to be in and I'm not in the career I want to be in because I don't have the connections I need and I don't have the connections I need because you know like and it, and it finally finally when I was really ready to face myself that's when I went to therapy which by the way I didn't go to therapy because of some big traumatic event I didn't go to therapy because something happened I just got tired of living my life and feeling the way I felt Every day when I woke up, I got tired of waking up tired. I got tired of waking up like crap. I'm awake. It's another day. That is not how God designed our lives to be. When we wake up in the morning, sincerely from the bottom of our heart and the pit of our soul, we should be like, ah, yes, another day. We should be excited. But in the reality People who do wake up happy, most of us can't stand them. (laughs) Most of us are like, where did you come from? Why are you so chipper? Because it's like the Bible says when Jesus was trying to retreat to go pray to be by himself. And the Bible says he looked upon the crowds and he was moved with compassion because he saw how they were harassed. So many of us don't wake up happy because we are harassed by the enemy. He's constantly sending lies our way that are making us fearful. And so we're living under oppression and strongholds like depression and anxiety. And we're not even aware that fear is at the root of our issue. I'm not going for my dreams because I'm afraid that I'm not enough. A lot of people will never, well, I'm not going to say will never. A lot of people have never even had that thought occur to them that they're afraid they're not enough. It's just, they say things like, you know, I'm not a Nepo baby, so, you know, I don't have it as easy as them. She probably slept her way. You know what I mean? We, We avoid ourselves and we judge others. That's what envy is too. Envy is so interesting because envy is that combination of jealousy and judgment. I deserve, it's, it's seeing what someone else has and feeling like you deserve it more than they do. That's envy. Jealousy is seeing something someone else has and, and wanting it, whether you have the right to want it or not. Like when people are jealous over their spouses, there's a certain level of right to have with jealousy for your spouse. To a degree, right? The Bible says that God is a jealous God because he's the only one who can honestly handle that emotion. Not only is he, that's what my dad would say. He's the only one who can handle jealousy. But I believe that God is a jealous God because he's the only one who has a right to be jealous. He's the one who created us and then not only created us, paid the price to get us back to him. He's the one who sacrificed everything for us. So for us to worship money more than him, Money will pass away, but he's the self-existing one. Without him, there would be no money. And you're worshiping money, a.k.a. your greed or your selfishness, a.k.a. your fear of not having enough. So in a way, fear is an idol. A lot of us have more faith in our fears than we have in the goodness of God. That's kind of deep. A lot of people might not be ready for that. Being fearful can be likened to idolatry. The idea and the notion that you're more afraid of this idea more than you have faith that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You know, there's another quote that I really like where um, it says you can have faith or you can have fear. Both require imagination. What will you use your imagination for? Are you going to use your imagination to imagine terrible things? Or are you going to use your imagination to uh, think about the possibility of beautiful things? But I tell you why a lot of people are afraid to imagine good things. 
because it's too painful. It's too painful to imagine the life you want because the disparity between the life you dream of and the one you're currently currently in is too great. And that distance creates such deep disappointment that it's easier to just put your head down and go through the day than to imagine something that feels like a child's fairy tale movie because I am so far from that life. But again, it comes down to faith over fear. Do you believe more that your life will never get better then you have faith that all things will work together for your good and that you're the head and not the tail, that you're a lender and not a borrower, that you're above and not beneath, that you're a ruler and not the ruled over, that you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field and that his angels have charge over you and that he'll be a ring of fire around you and that all things are possible to them that believe And what's impossible with man is possible with God. And that God is for you and not against you. And that he is near to each and every one of us. And that he is faithful and just to forgive. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And neither has entered into the hearts and minds of men what God has prepared for those who love him. That's why you got to know the truth. Because if you know the truth, you can combat those lies. It's it comes down to faith over fear. But see, you know, there's that scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What are you filling your head with? That's what we talked about last week the importance of fasting because we're constantly surrounded by distractions. The gods of this age, the gods of this world want to fill you with fear. What do you think the news cycle is for? The news cycle knows that if they constantly put out negative, fearful stories, you'll keep watching. Like, is there an update? Is there an update? What else is happening? Oh my gosh. Like I need to be aware. I need to know what's going on. When you watch the news, how often has a news story ever directly impacted you? Yes, of course, like if a truck flips over on the highway, that's going to affect everyone because of traffic. But if you really think about it, you're just filling your head with scary stuff. You need to be informed, but I promise you what you need to know will get to you between the push notifications on your phone that gives you the headlines, between going on social media and reading headlines, you'll get the information you need because that's what I do. That's what I do. So I'm I'm not saying you got to do what I do. I mean, I think also God has a different calling. Like if you're a journalist, then yeah, you're probably supposed to be in the news more than I am. But the way news is today, it's not super factual. It's about sensationalism more than facts. Um, So the way to combat fear is with truth. Truth being the word of God. Um, And I know for some people, the Bible is just like this really old book with all these stories. And even though I believe it and I believe in God, how do I relate this to my life? I really hope that this podcast helps people with that. And that's why I'm always bringing up scripture and I'm bringing up uh, the stories of people in the Old Testament. Y'all have heard me bring up David a couple of times. Like if you didn't know who David was before the orbital tribe, baby, <laughs> you know now. Um, and <laughs> I, I think that's also where I have to say, Jesus, get to know Jesus. If you didn't grow up in church, a great place to start is the New Testament. 
reading the first four gospels and you get to read about this incredible person (laughs) who was so radical and it's hard to know how radical he was without historical context. But I mean, during that day, a man could divorce his wife because he didn't like her hair. And Jesus, girls weren't even sent to school. They had to learn from their dads and their brothers and their husbands. I also believe that's why Paul says in um, Timothy, he says, I, you know, why uh, I think it was Corinthians, <laughs> Corinthians or Timothy, um, where he says, uh, wives, ask your husbands at home. If you have questions, ask them at home. Be quiet. Because girls weren't given the Torah to read. They literally had to ask their husbands. And so I think that's why Paul said that, not because women can never speak. I know my legalistic conservative crowd is like, aha, I knew there was something about this Hollywood lady talking about God. She's trying to come in here and turn women into, I'm I'm really not. It's just that Considering all of that, and you look how Jesus had women that were his disciples, if you look at how the first person he appeared to after he was resurrected was a woman, if you look at how when a woman was caught in the act of adultery, he covered her, he said, where are your accusers? I have none neither do I condemn you. That was so radical. And you can tell how radical it was because if she's caught in the act of adultery, why is she the only one brought before him? They let the man go. They let the man go. That's how little women were thought of. Because the Mosaic law, both of them were supposed to be stoned. But these people were so unjust These people were so sexist that they only wanted to bring the woman to justice and they wanted to kill her for having the audacity to be a sinner, just like the man she was with. When rightfully she should have died, Jesus gives us a foreshadowing of what he's going to do on the cross. And he gets her penalty lifted. So... If you don't know where to start when finding about out about this faith thing and this Jesus thing and this Christianity thing and this walk of faith, go read about this incredible man who was so radical and his and what made him radical was his love. He touched lepers. He touched the unclean. He wasn't afraid of people who smelled bad or were poor, or were dirty. Everyone was welcome in his crowd. And the thing about it is so many of us don't realize we're the leper. (laughs) We're the unclean ones. And he makes us clean with his righteousness. And his righteousness is his love. So um, when you understand who Christ is, and you understand his purpose, and how it's all fueled by love, we go back to that first scripture where there is fear, there is torment, but perfect love cast out fear. If you get to know who Christ is and you understand his perfect love, it will cast out fear. And you might have to do it over and over throughout the day because the devil is constantly trying to get our minds. He doesn't want us to return to heaven. He wants us to go to hell with him. So love is the remedy. But how do I know what love is? You look at the life of Christ. Stop looking for it in a significant other. I'm begging you from with every fiber of my being. It's like when God set me free from the curse that so many women are living under, that idolatry of marriage, that desire for your husband, but him ruling over you. And yes, there are different applications, but I think that one 
is what's uh, we're looking at mostly today because in one of, again, uh, I can't remember, I think it's Malachi, where it says in that day, seven women will grab hold of one man and say, let us be called by your name. We will eat our own food. We will wear our own clothes. Just let us be called by your name. Let us be your wives. I feel like that's today. So many women are making their own money. They have their own, but they're like, I just want a husband. And that comes from conditioning. We've been conditioned to desire that. Think about it. When we're girls, they give us dolls with kitchens and, and, and kins. They give boys trucks. That's why men don't know how to commit either because they're taught to want things and not the love of a good woman. And we're taught to want them and they're chasing things and we're chasing them and no one's chasing God. And that's why relationships are in the crapper because no one's chasing God. That is my digression. But so many of us are looking for love in the wrong thing or the wrong person. You need to look for it in Christ because baby, if you want to feel chosen, there is no greater love than that. And that is how you combat fear. You're afraid that you won't get married? First of all, Jesus didn't get married. That's number one. Number two, the Bible says that he will withhold no good thing from you. If you're still not married, it clearly is not good. Not that marriage isn't good. But we as society, as a society, we have ruined it and we're ruining one another and we're ruining our kids. And then they grow up and become ruined adults who get in relationships, who ruin other people. And so the cycle continues. So until it is good for you to be married, not because there's something wrong with you, but until there is a suitable mate, baby, it is better for you to be free and single but a lot of people aren't living free because they're single. They feel like they're afraid that it means something about them, that they're somehow not good enough or um, unlovable or undesirable or uh, going to die alone. I don't know. It's fear. Fear drives all of that. But when you understand that he withhold no good thing from me, and we live in a broken and fallen world, so it's just going to take some time, you know? So, so, and then also, you got to learn the reality, too. Fear will cloud our vision of the reality. Clear, fear will have us seeing illusions and shadows. And the image that a lot of people put on the Internet of relationships is an illusion. A lot of people married half baked bread y'all we live in a society where folk got to cook longer before they can be a spouse back in the day shh, men built their own houses with their own hands you got men today who you know brothers can't even cut no grass so people got to cook longer to today we're not as mature so what you should be afraid of is marrying the wrong person what you should be afraid of is something coming too soon and marriage being worse than being single because oftentimes that's what it is, especially people whose desire for marriage or at least the pang for it is fueled by fear that they won't be loved. Because the desire I believe is from God, but all the drama around it is fear-based. It's fear-based. And we pick from our fear. We pick from our wound. And then now we're in a relationship and it's like, I should have appreciated being single. I didn't understand how I could just get up and go when I wanted to. Set the thermostat to what I wanted to set it on. Not having twice the mess to clean up. Twice the electricity bill to pay. But fear tells us not to love where we are right now. And then because of that fear, our judgment is clouded. We pick wrong and it's worse than what it was. So you got to get to know God. 
and the truth of what he says and his love. And that is how you combat fear. Because some of you have a dream in your heart and you're afraid to go for it. And God really needs you to get unafraid. Because he has something for you to do that is going to impact the lives of so many people. And if I'm the enemy of your soul, I'm going to keep you hindered by fear and lies. And you need to get untethered from those lies and those fears. And fasting will help. Reading your Bible will help. Prayer. Prayer. And um, what you fill your head with. You know, listen to, you know, not just podcasts like this one, but other ones like it. Um listening to less secular music, find more gospel music, you know, um, watching less foolishness on TikTok. Cause I promise you, like you'll just be watching funny stuff, funny stuff. stuff and then if you keep scrolling long enough, something real strange will come up. I don't really get on TikTok like that, but TikTok is kind of strange. Y'all it's a strange X. Oh my gosh. X is where, Demons take off their mask and show their full selves. I mean, I'm I'm telling you, X is 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 the digital headquarters for hell. It's got to be. It's got to be. Um, you know, YouTube also has some weird. Ch- I mean, avenue. Okay, you can't do anything too long. All right, you gotta you gotta uh, careful what you fill in your head with. Um, so yeah, that is how to release fear. <laughs> the antidote to fear is love. What is love? Jesus and what he did and what he is doing even now at the right hand of God, interceding for each and every one of us. What is love? What God did by even sending Jesus, okay? So, y'all, that's season one. <laughs> that is season one of the Orbital Tribe. Um, Thank you for spending time with me. Please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, we will be back. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, we'll be back. So until next time. <laughs>